This is our Bible. This is God speaking to us. Our eyes are open. Our hearts are prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today, we make our Bible the final authority in our life so that in every circumstance, we will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are living this out, that in every circumstance, we continue to bear fruit and others see Christ in us. That is not because we are boasting, but because we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. So, Father, as we come before you to finish uh, the Rooted series, I ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit would think through my mind and speak through my lips, that you would remove all of me, Father God, and help me to express my heart about this chapter with truth, with love, and most importantly, Father, um, that you help me to remove my opinion. Help me to only speak what you have given me for your people for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I am sad that we're at the end because this is such a good study. And I hope that you all enjoyed it as much as we have. Um, and I really hope that you took the time to do the assignments. Um, and if you hadn't, that's, that's perfectly okay. I would just encourage you that when you have your morning devotional time with God, that you would find a way to meditate on it. Um, because I think it had a lot of relevance to us today. It could not have been more timely than right now. Um, I want to start with, so this chapter is why the church is important. And it's kind of funny to talk about that to the people that are in this room. <laughs> because if you didn't think it was important, you wouldn't be here. Um, so I'm going to explain uh, what this chapter was about, how it relates to the river, um, not just for the people that are sitting here, but for the people who are listening that may not be present. I was just waiting. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> it must have been important. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to start with, um, I want to start with some statistics. Because I think that um, we just need to be relevant. And we don't need to talk about why the church is important unless we know it's relevant. So, I found an interesting study about Christians in America from the year 2000 to 2020. In 2000, there were 35% of Americans were non-practicing Christians. In 2020, there were 43%. In that same time period, 45% of Americans practiced Christianity. In 2020, that number is 25%. Practicing Christian. Okay, non-practicing Christian is a Christian or a person who identifies themselves as a Christian, but they don't practice by coming to church, just so that you understand that, okay? Non-practicing in 2000 was 35, in 2020, 43. In 2000, practicing Christians were 45, in 2020, 25. Americans who did not associate themselves with being a Christian, whether non-practicing Christian or practicing Christian, 20%. In 2020, that number went to 32%. Now, of the Christians, the practicing Christians, in 1993, their attendance to church was 45%. So the people that actually practice Christianity, only 45% of those attend church. In 2020, including online streaming, that total was 29% of practicing Christians in America attending service, whether in person or online. However, the good news is in 2017, 
that number was 27%. So it went up 2%. 2%. Interesting about the study is that the one thing non-practicing Christians and Christians had in common was one thing. They agreed that prayer was important and they prayed at least once a week. Now let me tell you something about that. What I have found, I have been able to be a part of some groups that are secular groups um, where I've been invited into. Um, and because I'm the type of Christian that's just not going to disassociate myself with you because you're not a Christian is the reason they invited me. Um, and one thing I've learned is no matter what people believe, they always want prayer. And so one of the ways I have found it easier to share my faith is by simply asking, how can I pray for you? Because whether they believe in God or not, everybody wants prayer. And praise God, our prayer team is popping. <laughs> if you got something going down, you need to be letting us know because we will pray for you, whether it's on a chain, in a closet, <laughs> we will pray for you. All right, what's also interesting about the studies is that 71% of elders and boomers, I found it interesting that they came up with elders to talk about a generation, 71% of elders and boomers want in-person services and the majority of Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z prefer online services, as we've seen over this last year. Now, the only thing about online services is there's purpose for it, um, but sometimes we go into this place of complacency, which is what's happened over this last year. People already struggled coming to church and then you give them a year off of church, now it's harder to get them back in church because they're like, well, hey, you know, I've just been kicking it. Um, there's only so much you can get from the couch. But so grateful for what's online because God, I think, is more viral today than he's ever been because we have all of these technologies, which is great. Um, however, what we've seen in the Rooted series, I'm gonna go to page 12, is how God wants us to go from being complacent to a consumer, but he doesn't want you to just be a consumer. We don't wanna to come to church just to get fed. He wants us to go from consumer to connected, and he wants us to go from connected to being committed, and then from being committed to being compelled. Compelled to do what? To go out and tell our story to go out and share Jesus Christ, to go out and reach the community. But we don't just go from being a Christian being saved to going out to the community. There's this thing that happens between being saved and then going out into the world. Well, what you learn about what this is, is here at church. So we're gonna get into chapter 10 why is the church important? In church, we experience love, worship, and ceremonies. Now, <clears throat> I don't know, I know for us, like our kids, when they're dating somebody, they bring them over to the house. They're like overwhelmed with our love. So anybody, have you invited somebody over and they've never experienced your dynamic, your family dynamic, or just the love that you demonstrate and they're kind of put off by it because they're like, I'm not a huggy, touchy-feely, don't touch me. I'm not used to talking, you know, all of that. We get that people come here, they're new, and they're not sure, like, what is all this love going on? Well, in the church, we develop this bond. And our bond comes from being brothers and sisters in Christ. We are part of the family of God. So that's special to us, right? Okay, so this family bond creates this love. And because of this love we have for one another, we will do anything for anybody in this room. Right? Y'all like, I don't know. Okay, well, let's learn. We're going to learn Galatians 6.10. If you don't know, you're going to know by the time we get done. 
Galatians 6.10, it says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. So not just us, we should do good to everyone, but especially to those in the family of faith. Now, for to put to say especially to those of the family of faith, that puts a high value on the family of God. You know, Jesus said that I came to separate brother from sister, mother and father. So your relationship with your parents, your spouse, your kids does not trump the family of God. The family of God is more important. Okay, so it says you have to do good to everybody. Well, Paul takes it a step further, and he says, we're not just supposed to say we love us. We need to really love us. Don't just say, oh, girl, I love you, Jewel. No, I need to show Jewel I love her. So Romans 12, 9, we're going to read 9 to 21. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Now, just because you love them don't mean you have to like them, okay? There's a lot of people I love, but I don't really like. I don't like your ways. I don't like what you do. I don't like what you say, but I love you in Christ. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. Okay, I'm going to stop with this hate what is wrong, and only because Pastor Grady mentioned this earlier. So, you know, I love what he said that, we're all one race. We are all one. And over the weekend, I saw a news clipping. Trinity laughs at me because I only watch the world news because it's only for 30 minutes. Like, that's all I need. <laughs> Just give me a cliff note version <laughs> of what's happened in the world. That's all I need to know. That stuff is just too much noise for me. So I, I saw this clip of people in Florida were burning masks and, and all this stuff. And we have a mask that hangs in our war room to remind us to pray because the, the, the mask has been a dividing <laughs> a topic last year and it's still an issue. So we have it hanging in our war room to pray over it. But anyways, they're burning these masks. And I told Andre, I said, you know what's really sad to me is all of this hype around this mask. But where were these people when they weren't asking for justice for all the other things that we've seen take place? but you want to make this big thing over something so, in the big scheme of things, so minor compared to all the other issues we have going on. What about sex trafficking? Like so many things that are happening and you want to make this big stink over this one little thing. And, and you know, 10 years from now, we're going to talk about this and realize that was just so minor in the big scheme of everything else that is going on. There's so many, so many other things that are going on. But hate what is wrong. Hold on to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. You know how many times when life gets tough, the first thing people do is stop serving because they say, I'm too busy right now. I have too much going on. That's the wrong thing. You busy. Now you need to press in and serve even more, even more. It says never be lazy, work hard, and serve enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. I was taught that if God didn't answer your prayer, you didn't have enough faith. And you only ask God once and then you thank him. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says keep on asking, keep on asking, keep on asking. Keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. That's the issue I see right now. We have so much drama going on that all we're doing is finger pointing. Why can't we just bless and move forward. If every Christian did that, we wouldn't see so much bickering. <laughs> if every Christian just blessed, every time they saw something they didn't agree with, instead of giving their opinion about they don't agree, if they just stopped and said a prayer and blessed them and moved on, we'd be a, a whole lot better as a nation, as a body of Christ even at that. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. 
Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. You may not understand the things that are happening, but if your brother or sister is hurting, you should be weeping because they're hurting, whether you understand it or not. And the thing is, if you don't understand it, try to understand. I heard um, we were listening to a podcast, and I heard someone said, uh, you know, I just don't understand why you do this. And, and the counselor was like, well, that's the problem. You're the one that doesn't understand. So it's not that what they're doing is wrong. They're doing what they feel is right. You don't understand. Well, then the onus falls on you to try to understand. You don't have to like it. But if you don't understand it, if you don't understand something, if somebody's feelings are hurt and you cause the hurt, even though you don't understand it, try to understand it. Try to, because Ed and Laura used to tell this to Andre and I, you know, I would get, I, you know, I'm a tell on you. <laughs> and I tell, Andre did this, this, this. And, um, I know, right? And Lori would say, um, well, I would say, I don't understand why he does this. She says, well, d d did you ask? Well, no, it doesn't matter. I don't understand. And she was like, it doesn't matter whether I agree with it. But because I love him, if what I said or did hurt him, that should hurt me and upset me because I hurt him. And so for me to truly apologize, I have to understand what hurt him and recognize that and acknowledge, okay, now I understand that when I said this, that made you feel this way. And because I made you feel this way, I am sorry because I would never want to make you feel that way. You following me? And this is where we are with society. We don't like something. We don't understand something. So we bad mouth it instead of trying to understand it and bless and move on. See, we, we feel like it's for me to say something. I'm the Christian. I need to call it out. That's not what we we're called to do. We're called to bless and genuinely love and move on. Be happy with those that are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony. See, Holy Spirit was already talking. Live in harmony with each other. Sometimes to live in harmony means to be quiet. Because talking only leads to more foolishness if the other party is not willing to listen. It's one thing if you want resolution and we're both talking to work this out. It's another thing when you just want to state your truth and could care less. Well, then to live in harmony, we might have to be quiet. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. I, there's another translation that says, be willing to hang out with the nobodies. Sometimes we think we're, you know, I can't hang out with them. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay evil with evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. There's that harmony. Do all that you can to make sure that you live in peace. Now, some people think, I'm just going to unfriend you, and that's going to keep my peace. That might keep your peace for a minute. But if you unfriended somebody because you didn't like them, that means every time you see them, there's something in you. Sometimes to keep our peace is to just be quiet. When we're quiet and we genuinely walk in love, we preach louder than we speak. Dear friends, Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will never heap burning coals of shame over their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. I want to read to you page 204 if you have your book. 204 is the second paragraph from the bottom. And it says, as part of a family, we are valuable contributing members, not just attendees. We contribute our time, our money, our ideas, and our energy. We are not only served, but we serve as well. We together, we are together for times of celebration, 
challenge, and everything in between. See, when we gather as a church family, this is demonstrated when we do our communion service. We come together to worship, to share challenging times, and everything in between. We do life with each other. We do life, and, and we can only do so much life in this building. The church is important, but the church is very important when we leave these walls because that's when we're experiencing life with each other. On page 205, um, the first paragraph right underneath Romans 12, it says, this passage describes belong perfectly. It says to love one another, which means to take a genuine interest in people we encounter and to pause and consider how they are or what they might need in that particular moment. People are drawn into a relationship with Christ through the kindness of real love more often than theological arguments, and I would add political arguments. Conversely, people are driven from the church by the hardness and ugliness of the fake or hypocritical Christians more than by their religious doubts. Think about that for a moment. A lot of people who are not coming to church isn't necessarily because they don't believe that God exists. They're not coming to church because they don't want to be amongst the hypocrites. Because what you say you believe is not demonstrated. So why would I want to come and be a part of that? Now that doesn't mean that that's everybody here in this room. But as a whole, the body of Christ, that is what has been displayed and why so many don't want anything to do with it. Now, we can't change the entire body of Christ, but we can all do our part. Each one, teach one. I just need to do my part. You need to do your part. And if we all did our part, we will affect the world in our community. So if I'm doing my part, I'm affecting the people in my house. If I'm doing my part, I'm affecting the people I work with. If I'm doing my part, I'm affecting the checker I come in contact with at the grocery store. And likewise for each of you. You following me? Now, in church, we experience worship. Now, Pastor Grady always says, don't miss worship. We tell you don't miss worship, not because we want you to come sing with us. We don't want you to miss the experience of the Holy Spirit that we experience every week when we come. Now, this is going to blow your mind. You remember I asked you in chapter 8 if you were a hustler or a worshiper. Y'all remember that? Okay. Turn to John 4. Now, I know Pastor Grady had already talked about this, but I'm about to take it a step further, and this is only confirmation since he touched on it, um, and it's not a coincidence. Jesus replied in John 4, 21, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while the Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers, say true worshipers, will worship the Father in what? And true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is looking for those who what? Worship him in that way. What is that way? In spirit and in truth. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, when I study the Bible, I ask myself questions. So, God is looking for those who worship him in that way. What's that way? That way is in spirit and truth. Well, if he's looking for someone to worship him in spirit, then I need to know what does worshiping him in spirit look like? Because he's looking. So you know when you go to the store, and you know sometimes it depends on the store you're at. If you're at the grocery store, they don't really say, can I help you find what you need? But if you walk into a department store or at a mall, they real quick, they're like vultures. <laughs> What you looking for? 
And, you know, if I know what I'm looking for, I don't need no help. And sometimes I'm just browsing, so I don't need your help. I'm just browsing. If I see something I want, great. If I don't, whatever. But if you go to a store and you're looking for something, you're looking for something. Say, if I'm looking for a candle, I'm not going to go look at towels because I'm not looking for that. Or you might tell me, oh, here's today's special. That's nice, but that's not what I'm here for. I'm specifically looking for a candle. And unless you look like a candle, I don't have any need for you. You follow me? Okay. So God is at the grocery store looking for true worshipers. So you don't look like a true worshiper. He ain't looking for you. Okay. But what, let's all not be spiritual. What is worshiping in spirit? Well, because I read my Bible. The answer is in Galatians 5. See, our Bible confession. This is my Bible. This is God speaking to me to receive all his promises and instructions. If you don't read your Bible, you don't know the promises. You ain't going to get the promise unless you do the instruction. And if you don't read what the instructions are, you won't get the promise. Galatians 5. Okay, Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit. You should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you don't do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, in case y'all don't know what the work of the flesh is, it's evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, socketry, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, decisions, heresies, Eve, envy, murder, drunkenness, welveries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You follow me? All right. But, say but, the fruit of the Spirit. Let's talk about our Bible confession for a minute. We say that I will bear good fruit in every circumstance, right? We don't have to live perfect, but if we're accepting the word as the final authority in our life, we will bear good fruit in every circumstance, and people will see Christ in us, okay? The fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit means that is the evidence that you're walking in the Spirit, so to bear good fruit in the Spirit, the evidence of walking in the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's it. I'm not taking this no more. Well, then you ain't walking in the Spirit. Because walking in the Spirit is long-suffering, which means you're going to suffer even if they hurt you 5,000 times. Consider yourself evidence in the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are in Christ, say, I'm in Christ, have crucified the flesh, say, my flesh, with its passions and desires. If, say, if, we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. So when I'm in the Spirit, I am love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentle, and self-control. When I'm in the flesh, I am not a worshiper because I am, I have hatred, uncleanliness, fornication, murder, envy, drunkenness, selfish ambition, decisions, contention. So much contention going on within the body of Christ is ridiculous. So if I want to be in the spirit, if God is looking for true worshipers, when I am walking in the fruit of the spirit, guess who he looking for? When I'm not walking in the spirit, he ain't looking for you. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be found. He's looking for, I'm not a hustler. Now, I can hustle when I need to, but I'm a worshiper. 
and you know, we do have moments where, you know, we are walking in the flesh at eight, but at nine, we in the spirit. And at 10, I might be in the flesh, but at 1030, I'm back in the spirit. And if it's hot outside, that's the only time I love walk comes into question. I don't do good when it's hot. We have to make it a priority to be a worshiper. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So how do I know if I'm not in the spirit? Well, one, are you walking in the fruit of the spirit? And two, do you have any bondage? Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's what uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17 says. Well, when we are having bondage to fear, greed, depression, anxiety, addictions, there's the, the spirit of the Lord, there's no liberty there. Those are the things that keep us from walking in the spirit. And if that's you, thank goodness we serve a God that says, if you need something, just ask for it. We don't have to be perfect. We just need to ask. He tells us in James 1, 5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Unlike us, our children to ask us for something, we'll be like, do you think you deserve that? Do you think with the way you've been acting, I should be giving this to you? Thank goodness Jesus don't do that to us. So if you're not walking in the spirit, that's okay. Just ask God. Look, looky here, Lord. She getting on my nerves. I'm trying to walk in love, but it's hard. I need you to help me. I need you to help me look at her and not be angry. Because right now I am. God can handle that. And trust me, if you didn't tell him, he knows your heart. He knows that's how you really feel. He knows that's how you really feel, so why are you faking the funk? Just, just be real. He already know. Lord, I know I'm supposed to walk in love. I remember I was struggling with somebody, and I was so hurt that their reaction to me was wrong. I had called Lori to tell her about it, and she was like, you know how they are? Why are you upset? And I was like, because I'm believing the best of every person. Because <laughs> I was like, really? Believing the best of every person. But not everybody is going to do what they're supposed to do. But if we're walking in the spirit, we can't allow our flesh to take over because when it does, it puts us out of true worship with God. And God is looking for those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So even if you're going through something where you feel like your response is wrong, you're not in a good place, worship him in truth right there. Lord, I'm struggling. He wants you to worship him in spirit, but also in truth. Don't be, you know, trying to sound all holy with God. He know if you really ain't. He would rather take your cursing self like that day Tara was like, I told my neighbor this is not the time to F and ask questions, just F and pray. <laughs> well, that was true to her. And God will take that truth and do something with it. We come to church so that we can celebrate together. There are only two things that bring us together for celebration that's important to our faith. That is baptism and communion. Both have to do with our faith. When someone is baptized, that is a public demonstration of what they've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord of, of their Savior. That is their public demonstration. And where else should they go to do that than at church? with the people, their church family. In Romans 6, 4, it says, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also live new lives. Well, just the fact that this baptism is a reflection of being dead to sin as you merge and as you come up being raised with Christ Without Christ dying on the cross and doing that, we would not be saved. And that very fact, that truth, is what we celebrate in communion, which we were given instruction to do that as often as we remember, which means we should be doing that more than just here at church on the first Sunday. Taking communion is something we should be doing regularly in our own homes because your faith 
you calling yourself a Christian, a follower of Christ, that is only possible because of what Christ did on the cross, which is why he's saying this is something that we should be doing. 1 Corinthians 11.23, Jesus is saying, for I pass unto you what I receive. Oh, this is actually Paul. I pass unto you what I receive from the Lord himself. One night when he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread. I'm sorry, this is Jesus. <laughs> One night he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread and gave to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of the wine after supper, saying, this cup is in the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. We gather to celebrate communion, to celebrate that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for us. This is a celebration. The reason we do it on the first Sunday of the month, it is a part of our worship service because that is something to be celebrated. Just like if you were to do a wedding, hello, the Lord's calling. <laughs> if we were to do a wedding, a, um, a baby shower, um, a graduation, there's a celebration because this milestone has come up and we want to celebrate it. That's what we do for the things that are important. Well, when we come to church, we love, we worship, and we celebrate. We celebrate when somebody decides to give their life to Christ, and we celebrate remembering what Jesus did for us so that we actually have eternal life in heaven. Because without it, we wouldn't be going. Without it, we wouldn't be worshiping. Without it, we would not experience this bond we have as being a part of the family of God. That is something to celebrate. That is something we do together that you cannot experience from your couch. You can take communion at home, we do. But this experience of worship, of love, of unity, this bond coming together, partaking of the Lord's Supper together, that can't happen unless you come into the body, your church family. Now, <clears throat> this part is not in the book, but this is what God gave me after studying this chapter for our church and I'm getting hot. <laughs> you don't have to change anything. I'm just saying, whoo, it's hot up in here. Okay. I know it has come up numerous times about whether or not I feel like I'm at the right church. I'm not saying me. I'm saying this is a question for the people in this room or the people who are not in this room that are listening right now. The experience of the church body beyond love, worship, and ceremonies is for us to mature in Christ together. There's a maturity level we grow in our relationship with Christ when we come together. You can only grow so much on your own. Okay, you following me? Romans 1.12 says, that we may be mutually strengthened, encouraged, and comforted by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And what that means is that in order for my faith to be strengthened, there's something you have to impart to me for my faith to be strengthened by you. This does, this does not stop at, I can only be strengthened by the pastor, this means I can come to church and be encouraged and strengthened by listening to my brother Victor, by listening to Vicki. This maturity happens. How do I know I'm in the right church? Am I maturing in my relationship with Christ with the people I'm doing church with? Now just follow me for a second, okay? I have been in a church for 10 years before I started serving. And for those 10 years, all I came late on purpose and I left early on purpose because I didn't want to communicate. I just wanted to come to church, get the word, and go home. 
I came late because I didn't want to do worship. I was only coming to get the word. And when they said, let's pray, I was out. I didn't have to talk to nobody. I'll roll up in sweats. Did I go to church today? Yes, I did. Check. Just keeping it real. After 10 years of doing that and I started to serve, I started to grow. Okay? It wasn't until my relationship with Pastor Lori that I really started to grow both in my personal life and spiritually because I learned how my relationship with Christ wasn't about what I did at church. That's where I learned my relationship with Christ is what I do every day as a wife. It's what I do every day as a mother. But I had nobody to show me that or walk with me to show me what that looks like. I've seen enough of church, trust me, I grew up in the church. But even growing up in the church, I never saw any of those people live what they were teaching us every day. So I couldn't under, I didn't understand how those work. I thought you either church or you're nothing. And the church looked really boring to me. So think about this. Last week, um, Miss Maddie shared how she went to the grocery store and somebody behind her paid for her, right? She shared that about 10, 15 minutes after we left church, Sister Sally called me to tell me that she went to Capriotti's to get a sandwich for her and Ron. She saw uh, somebody homeless outside, so she decided to go and get that person a sandwich. She went back into the store to get the sandwich, and the worker, because Sally gets sandwiches there often, said, uh, when she told her she wanted to get a sandwich so she can give it to the lady, the worker said, no, Miss Sally, we'll take care of it. So Sally didn't even have to pay for it. But Sally called me because she was like, the way God provided for Miss Maddie, you see, that encouraged Sally. She left church, was inspired and strengthened and saw an opportunity and was like, I want to bless her. But then God stepped in and said, no, I'll take care of it. You don't need to pay for it. Sally didn't even have to pay for it. But you see how that works? Like, but this only works if we didn't do the first Sunday. I know we call it open mic. We call it an open mic because the mic is open to anybody who wants to speak. It's not limited to us. But if we didn't have an, a place to do that, how would you hear about these things that are going on in each other's life? Church isn't about just come and get this message. It's about you coming and telling us your stuff. Tell us life sucks. And then tell us when it's great so that we can rejoice with you and weep with you. So ha have you grown? Have I grown in this church? Have I grown with the people that are walking through life with me? Have they walked with me in my most troubled times? And how did I grow in my maturity? Elder Reggie, Sister Jewel, I tell you, every time they speak, they minister to me. We've seen them grown. We've seen Pastor Ron grow with prayer, the prayer ministry. Ronnie has stepped up to take over media. Praise God for that. Even Alicia, who did it before she left, Alicia didn't serve anywhere else. Praise God that she stepped in. And Ashley back there volunteering. This is what, this is what growing together looks like growing like thinking, I didn't have skills to do this, but you're doing it. Because like Pastor Grady said, because it's already in you. So I want to read this to you in closing. I had to have Trinity send it to me because I left it at home. Um, so I got to get it off my phone. But why are Andre and I here? Is this church the right church for us? This prayer I've shared before. There's a second part of this prayer that I want to share. Everything that we do in life has a purpose. And 
if we're looking for something other than the purpose God has given us, we'll be looking for a long time, and we'll always be looking for something to fill this void. It'll never be filled, and you'll always be searching for something. Pastor Lori had given me this. Um, it was one day she had called and asked me to read this particular devotion, but she said this was her prayer to me. This has become me and Andre, this bad English, Andre and I's <laughs> prayer to you. I'm going to read you the prayer, but then I'm going to read you the confession. Um, the prayer says, Lord, help me invest my life in the people who will grow strong and who will bring forth good fruit. This was Lori's prayer to me. I want to give my life to people who are going to do something in this world. I want to know that I have made a difference in the life of someone who is going to make the difference in the life of others. The last thing I want is to have lived this life without ever making a personal investment in anyone. So please help me recognize those people you want me to pour myself into. Then give me the wisdom and the grace to pull alongside of them and share with them the, journey, the treasures that you have placed in me. I am forever grateful that Lori came alongside of me and poured into me. It was good ground. It was good ground, and it brought forth fruit. But I don't want that to stop there. I want to do the same thing. I want to pour into good ground, to good fruit. So what 